The pawn noise emitter and pawn sensing systems can be effective, but these systems don't take into account the volume of the sound that might be heard from a particular location. If stealth is important to your game, or if you want the volume of a sound to affect objects in the game according to their distance from the source, then we'll need to develop an alternative system. In this video we're going to look at the idea of creating an audio listener and using amplitude envelope analysis so that the listener takes into account the amplitude of the audio that might be reaching it depending on distance. I'm going to be using the words listen and hear quite a bit in this video. Just bear in mind that we're creating a proxy for listening and hearing within the game, so consider these words to be in quotation marks. Bookmark key 5 in the demonstration project brings us outside the caves, but if we turn right and cross the river, you can see a circle of mushrooms on the grass. Standing within this circle, you're able to cast a magic bolt spell. I'm just going to find the wisp blueprint that's on the opposite side of the river and turn off the movement for that blueprint so that we can focus a bit more on these particles on the opposite side of the river. So pressing P launches our magic bolt. What you'll notice is that the floating particles across the river are responding to the explosion sound of that spell and also they're responding differently depending on their distance from it. These blueprints have a custom event that allows them to receive the envelope value from the explosion sound and this value is used to scale their particle system. The spell is cast by this blueprint here, the BP DC listener distance system. This is quite simple. If the player is within bounds of the collision sphere, then on receiving the key input, it plays the spell launch sound, magic bolt particle launch, then gets the player location and rotation, and then spawns another blueprint, the BP DC noisemaker. We also use this blueprint in the next video, where we analyse the frequencies of the impact sound in order to trigger a camera shake effect. I'm just going to turn the camera shake off for the moment, since it can get a bit annoying after a while. This is the audio component that's played when the spell impacts on something. Opening the sound cue, you can see that the final sound is a composite of several different layers. We want to get the envelope of the sound they produce, so each of them has envelope analysis enabled. And we've discussed this in detail in a previous video. The other thing that is important for our current system is that we've assigned an attenuation setting to this audio component called Noisemaker. At the moment, the settings are in a radius 50 units, and then it falls off over 4,000 units. When this blueprint is spawned into the world, we get an event, Begin Play. The first thing we do is to get those attenuation settings. We're adding them to this variable that we're using for the camera shake system in the next video. But for our current system, we're breaking out several other values and assigning them to variables. The attenuation function, which you'll remember is essentially the shape of the curve that the sound uses over the fall off distance. And here we have the choice of linear, logarithmic, inverse, log reverse, natural sound or custom curves. And we're also storing the attenuation radius and the attenuation fall off distance. The blueprint has a sphere collision component and in the event graph we're getting a on component hit event to start our system. The first thing we do is to destroy the particle system that's active when the blueprint is flying through the air and then activate the impact particle. We want the new noisemaker impact to supersede any that might already be active in the world. So we get all actors of class noisemaker and we check the length of that array. If the length is greater than one, then it means that there's another noisemaker alive in the world in addition to this one. And so we read through that array, ignoring self, and then we check whether the audio component is actually playing. Because there might be a noisemaker that's alive in the world but still flying through the air. If this is true, then we destroy the old blueprint. Next, we set the radius of a second collision sphere called the overlap checker. This is where we get the first lot of information from our sound attenuation settings. 
Adding together the attenuation radius and the fall-off distance of the sound will give us the radius at which a sound might possibly be heard. So if the sound's inner radius is 50 and the fall-off distance is 4000, then we're setting our overlap checker radius to 4050. Then we're getting all the actors that overlap with the collision sphere, in other words, all actors that might hear this sound. We're getting the actors irrespective of class here, so we've left this unassigned. At the moment, we know that our listeners all belong to the BP DC listener orb class, so we could just get it to check purely for that class, which would be cheaper and quicker. But we might want to add the ability to listen or hear sounds to other actors, as we'll see later on. It might also be the case that you only want specific actors to listen. So once we've got our array of overlapping actors, we're going to check if they have the tag listener. And only if they do, do we add them to our final array of overlapping listeners. Looking at these BPDC listener actors in the level, you can see that they are all tagged with listener. Once we've got our array of actors that might hear the sounds, we trigger the impact sound itself and then we disable the collision for this blueprint. This is just to make sure that two of these blueprints don't accidentally trigger each other off. Let's look at the results of this process so far. So we'll add a print string here. And what we'll look at is the length of this array. So with our sound's attenuation settings of 50 for the inner radius and 4000 for the fall off distance, when we fire off a magic spell here, it's likely that all of these listeners will be included in that array. So there we get all 13 because all 13 fell within those attenuation distances. Now if I fire this off and it lands further away, you still got all 13 there, so I need to go a bit further. That time we only got eight. And if I change my attenuation distances here, so say it falls off over 1,500 this time, you'll see that we capture fewer actors within that attenuation distance because obviously it's much smaller. So that time we only got nine, eight, as we move further away, seven, etc. It's worth noting that on the sound cue itself, I've set the voice management option here to play when silent. Since the sound might play at some distance away, the player may be out of range of the sound's attenuation fall-off distance. The engine doesn't play sounds that the player can't hear, so for this purpose we need to set the sound to still play when silent so that the other actors can hear it. From our audio component, we're getting events on audio playback percent. So once the sound starts, this is going to be outputting an event every frame. Firstly, we check whether we have any actors in our array of overlapping listeners, since if we don't, there's no point continuing the process. If we do have overlapping listeners, in other words, the length of the array is greater than zero, then we get cooked envelope data from our audio component. As discussed in previous videos, this gets us the current envelope data interpolated and averaged across all playing sounds on the audio component. We assign this to the variable out envelope data. The system then goes through each actor in turn, assigns it to the current listener variable, and finds out how far away this listener is from the sound. Given that it's this actor that's playing the sound, we get a reference to self and take this vector away from the actor's location vector to get our distance from sound value. Now that we know how far away this particular listener is from the sound, and we know the sound's attenuation settings, we can scale the envelope for this particular sound. The distance from sound variable is the listener's distance from the sound, and we take the attenuation radius of the sound away from that in order to get the listener's position within the falloff range. We use the sound's falloff distance to map this value to a range between 1 and 0, inverting the distance so that high distance values give us hearing amplitudes closer to 0, and low distance values give us amplitudes closer to 1. We then apply some maths to imitate the attenuation functions and multiply the current envelope data by this scaling amount. This gives us a proxy for the amplitude of the sound as it might be heard by the actor at this distance away. 
Now, at the moment, we know that all of our current listener actors are BP DC listener orbs. So we cast this blueprint so that we can target the custom event within that blueprint and send the envelope value to it. In this instance, it's used to set the scale for the particle systems. So let's have another look at that in action. I set the fall off distance in that attenuation deliberately to 1500 since that represents the distance from the middle one of these listeners to the outer ones. So there you can see them responding when we have an attenuation function that is linear. If we switch that and change that to a logarithmic attenuation function you should see a slightly different response. So there you can see the sound drops off in volume much more quickly over distance. Let's finish by having a quick look at how you might attach this listener functionality to other blueprints. Back in the level, we notice this mysterious object over here, which happens to be a magic pumpkin generator. And luckily, that's exactly the kind of thing we need for this next demonstration. So if we open our BP DC listener pumpkin blueprint, we can see that all we've got in there so far is a static mesh of a pumpkin. And we're going to make this pumpkin here the envelope of the spell explosion sound and convert it into a kind of force that's going to impact on this pumpkin. So the first thing we need to do is to create a custom event. And we'll call it receive envelope value, like we did for the listener orbs, and compile that. Back in our noise maker, if we've cast to the current listener and it's not a BPDC listener orb, then it might be a pumpkin. So we'll cast to BPDC listener pumpkin and then target that custom event, receive envelope value. So let's just see if that's working. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the magic pumpkin generator. So you can see here there's some public variables, the number of pumpkins we want to generate and the tags to give pumpkin. Now, because these pumpkins aren't in the world, we can't just add actor tags to them. So we're adding the tag when it is spawned. So let's add our old friend, the print string here to see if that system's working. I'm just gonna put the fall off distances back to something uh, a bit more usable. And then we will stroll over to our magical pumpkin generator, generate some pumpkins, fire off our magic bolt, and we can see that those pumpkins have outputted that print string. In other words, that cast to that BP listener pumpkin was successful. So now let's add something useful to it. I'm going to create two inputs uh, to this custom event. One is going to be the envelope value and that's going to be a float and the other one is going to be the location of the sound itself and that's going to be a vector. What we'll do is we'll get a reference to the static mesh and then we'll add a radial impulse. So when the spell goes off we want to have a physics push from that location and we'll apply it to a, a radius of a thousand. We'll make it a velocity change and we'll use the amplitude envelope multiplied by 200 to control the force of that radial impulse. So we'll attach that to strength. So going back to our noise make, you can see those inputs have now appeared. So this is our envelope value and we'll get actor location for our vector. So let's generate some more pumpkins and cast a spell. Now what we should see is that the pumpkins further away from the origin of the spell impact react less to that impact than the ones closest to it. So you can see there that the ones near to it reacted, but these ones over here didn't. 
And that's because we're able to scale the envelope of that sound over distance. In this video, we've seen how we can set up a system where listener blueprints can listen out for a particular sound source and then use the envelope of that sound source to modify themselves. Importantly, we're able to scale that envelope value using the attenuation settings of the sound. So the listener is hearing the sound at an appropriate volume given its distance from the sound source. In our case, we've used this envelope value, scaled by distance, to affect the appearance of particle systems and for a physics push type event, but there's a huge range of other applications for this technique. 